we have Dr. John Farrell. Dr. Farrell is a professor in the Department of Environmental Biology at SUNY ESF and the director of the Thousand Islands Biological Station in Clayton, New York. He is dedicated to research and management of freshwater aquatic systems with an emphasis on conservation and management of native sport fish, especially northern pike and muskie. John has mentored 40 grad students and hundreds of undergrads and received the ESF Exemplary Research Award in 2017, SUNY Chancellor Award of Excellence in Scholarship and Creative Activities in 2022, and was inducted into the Muskies Canada Hall of Fame in research category in 2023. He created the Fish Habitat Conservation Strategy, a multi-partnered effort between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the New York State DEC, to restore critical habitat for native fish species and contributed significantly to the international management of fish and fish populations. He is a uh, coordinator for the Aquatic and Fishery Science Program at ESF and teaches multiple fisheries courses. He's an avid Bills fan, go Bills, and loves the outdoors and enjoys spending time afield, fishing, hunting, skiing with his friends and family. Please welcome Dr. John Farrell talking about conservation and management of native predatory fishes within New York's northern connection to the Atlantic Ocean, the International St. Lawrence River. Thank you, Samantha. I just I want to thank uh, New York AFS uh, and all the people that helped organize this awesome gathering. It's great to see everyone. Uh, so, you know, I, I work on uh, the St. Lawrence River. I've dedicated my career to it, and it, I think it kind of links well to the the theme of this conference, it lands to oceans, um, and we have uh, this northern connection to the ocean that sometimes gets forgotten, um, but. Uh, you know, I kind of want to focus on that today, and, and uh, the predator fish, no surprise, we're going to be talking a lot about assassins, but not just assassins. So, um, here we go. So, you know, with this talk, I just want to introduce the recreational fishery. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, how we manage water in this system. So, we just had a, a talk earlier um, on the Never Sink, and there's, you know, similar issues with the, this International Joint Commission and the management of water in the system. Um, and we're going to talk about like a little bit of history, the seaway and, and this concept of invasional meltdown and, you know, thinking of whether the Great Lakes and the Upper St. Lawrence really meet the, the criteria of invasional meltdown. So we'll get into that. We, we have a new fish in the system, um, which is no surprise, actually several new fish uh, due to invasions that we'll talk about. And, uh, you know, the concept of is for a sausage, a crowd in the system and you know can we help can we really it's such a large uh, and complex ecosystem when I first started working there uh, 35 years ago it was like daunting I worked with Steve LePan and, and uh, DEC has supported our work since 1987 so it's just remarkable and in such a large system it's hard to fathom that we can actually make a difference but we I've learned that we really can uh, in this complex system so that's the, the outline um, so economic importance, there was a, DEC hired a consultant to do a, an economic survey of angling back in 2017. Unfortunately, I don't know if you could have picked a worse year to do it because the, the year 2017 was the flood in the Great Lakes. So uh, uh, not many people were on the, on the water because of uh, extreme like uh, uh, historic flooding that occurred at that time. But the survey was done and it, it's, it, it ranks among you know the top fisheries in the state. Um, you know over a half million angler days, 13% of uh, Great Lakes fishing effort, and, and lots of money is spent in the fishery. Total output of 84 million. So what's more important to these numbers is that there's this is just the U.S. side, so it's an international water body. So there's you know angling on both the U.S. and Canadian side, kind of somewhere uh, New York and Vermont on Lake Champlain. And, and we have uh, a lot of tournament activity. So, you know, this is uh, a picture of uh, some tournament, uh, tournament anglers. And, and so we just get these high concentrated pulses of fishing effort. At other times, it can be quite quiet. So uh, a lot of fish importance. In, in the St. Lawrence River, if you talk to anglers, you know, it's not always about catch rate. It can be, but big fish is, equals the popularity to this system. It's a, it's a huge draw for people that come to catch these quote unquote trophy size uh, predators in the ecosystem and these are just a few examples uh, you know New York State record walleye uh, there was a, a shared record uh, smallmouth bass recently 
And then the uh, famous muscle that uh, uh, R Captain Richie Clark caught with his customer that was 60 inches and he let it go, which, which is a part of this story. And then more recently, we had the uh, um, Minn Kota Bassmasters Elite Tournament in 2023. Uh, these tournaments are massive, and Patrick Walters caught 105 pounds of smallmouth bass. He was calling smallmouth bass that were over five pounds, like multiple five pound fish he was throwing out because they weren't heavy enough. And uh, that's the largest smallmouth bass total for any tournament in, that's ever happened. So and the, the, you know, the popularity of the fishery is just massive uh, and, and uh, it's, smallmouth bass is the primary target. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the river. Um, this, the St. Lawrence uh, is really, uh, if you look at different books, you'll get different measurements on, on how long the river is and things like that. And it depends on how you measure it. So, you know, if you want to get technical, you have to go up to Lake Superior, right? And there's uh, this Wasabi Range uh, and Lake Superior, and there's a small tributary that begins the Great Lakes. Uh, when you measure it down below the Saginaw River, Saginaw River uh, in Quebec down here uh, near the Gulf in the tidal section, the, the basin is something like 1.3 million square kilometers. So it's a major east-west drainage in uh, eastern North America. Uh, you know, it's the drainage of all the Great Lakes, the only natural outlet of the Great Lakes. There is a diversion. Um, and, you know, it's just a, a massive ecosystem. The average discharge um, at the mouth is about 10,400 cubic meters per second. So in terms of, like, flow, this is one of the largest rivers on the planet. Um, it also is a unique river. It's probably number one in, in being a system that delivers the least amount of sediment. So this is a like a clear water system. This is Great Lakes water, and it's moving to the ocean, um, and it's an international water, and it, it's uh, very dynamic. Whoops, I already screwed up my talk. <laughs> So the river is, uh, to go back. There it goes. so here we have a video. This is the construction of the uh, Robert Moses Saunders power dam. They blew up, there's a massive explosion. I'd like to play the audio, but I'm not. And it actually <laughs> blew up a sill. There was a limestone sill, which was the natural control point for, for the water levels and hydrodynamics in the system. And they moved that control point to the Robert Moses Saunders power dam and uh, it uh, led to um, the, the removal of, of this Long Sioux Rapid. So this is what we now call the South Channel. Um, so the South Channel is this section right here inside of Bar Barnhart Island and this Long Sioux Dam um, basically moves the water around and through the power dam around Barnhart Island and it created what we call Lake St. Lawrence which is a which is a huge fluvial lake increased about 300 percent in surface area so you can see how the river used to meander this is the Long Sioux Rapids and now it's like this large fluvial lake and, and so we work there uh, we work primarily with our colleagues from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and we're also working in the Thousand Islands which is above this section of the river and, and physiographically hasn't changed from the dam. But there's other effects of the dam that include Lake Ontario and, and the uh, formation of, of water, water level regulation we'll talk more about. So, you know, what's really interesting about the Great Lakes system and its basin is, is we basically have one river, you know, starting from Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Huron, the Georgian Bay, through Lake Erie, out through Lake Ontario and then down through the St. Lawrence River to the ocean. And, and you get basically a lot of multiple hydro patterns that occur along, if you follow this path of water. And the, the regulated portions of the Great Lakes would include Lake Superior and also Lake Ontario. So the lakes uh, in between those are not regulated. So they're, they're really interesting to look at in comparison. And then as we go down out to the ocean, there, there's two dams. There's the Robert Moses Saunders Power Dam that I mentioned before, and then there's also a dam uh, in Quebec. So there's only two dams that are affecting this system, but there's also a system of locks that have allowed uh, 
transoceanic shipping, and also uh, what we call, these are the salties, and then there's also the lakers that are within the system that, that make up uh, container ships, uh, and they're primarily working within the Great Lakes, but the, about 14% of the traffic is with these salties that are uh, making transoceanic voyages. So here, here's a map of shipping, shipping traffic, and you can see along the east coast there's just these dark reds. That's a lot of uh, shipping activity, but you can see that right here into the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, there's a main artery um, coming down into the St. Lawrence and, and going throughout the Great Lakes ecosystem. So that's, that was part of the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, development project to, to harness the river uh, for uh, hydroelectric development. Um, and also provide uh, international shipping. So when they, when they created uh, Lake St. Lawrence, uh, that was part of that process. They had to move villages um, out of the, the floodplain. Um, if you can imagine your rival high school, uh, all of a sudden you gotta move into their school. It was that kind of stuff. So thousands of people were impacted. There's uh, uh, some series called Lost Villages if you wanna look into the impacts uh, on communities of this dam. Uh, but uh, shipping, and you know, it also, there, there's kind of a couple major themes here. One is like it, it brought in like a whole suite of non-indigenous uh, aquatic species. So, you know, this is the unintended consequence. There was only one zoologist that was appointed to this entire process. There was no NEPA, there was no regulation. Must have been great as an engineer to be able to be part of this, uh, one of these major federal projects, international projects at the time. Uh, but um, there was very little environmental review, so now you know we're, we're managing that. So there's been about 190 or more invasive species. About 60% uh, to two thirds of those are directly related to ballast water and, and, and the seaway itself. And, and many of these species have spread across North America. So it, it's had uh, a big unintended consequence. I'm going to really focus. You know, dracinid mussels, uh, everybody knows about, but they came into our, our system. There were uh, first zebra mussels and then quagga mussels, and they, they began, uh, Ed Mills had to set up some plates, and we picked up some, some quagga mussels in 1993 uh, on, in the upper St. Lawrence River, and then we had the invasions of uh, round goby uh, beginning in 2003, but in earnest in about 2005. So there's, there's all these invasive species that have come into the system that, that really affect us today. We're, we're kind of bracing for this one. This is European tench. So tench has been found in, in New York waters. It hasn't made it into our surveys, but you know, this is a species that, that people are looking out for. And, there, and there's many other that, others that exist in the system um, that we're trying to understand their impacts. So this concept of invasional meltdown, you know, this comes from like foundations of ecology. So when we look at uh, you know Charles Elton back in the late 1950s with seminal works on invasive species came up with the concept of biotic resistance. And you know biotic resistance was the force that, that native species had um, to resist uh, impact. So the, the point being that that, that carried for, for decades until uh, this work by um, Dan Simbaroff um, and Von Halle in uh, Biological Invasions where they, they started to recognize in a, in a survey that there was very little work looking at the interactions of non-indigenous species. So it was kind of focused at that time more on how native species uh, provided this uh, biotic resistance and less on, on interactions between invasive species. And I think as more and more invasive species came in and started to establish in North America and also in Europe um, and other places in the world that, that, we, that we saw that we must learn more about their, their interactions. And they came up with this concept called invasional meltdown where, where synergistic and interactions among invaders could actually facilitate and accelerate their impacts on, on native ecosystems. So that's kind of a bar to look at, you know, some invasive species might be more innocuous, innocuous than others. So, invasional meltdown, is, it sounds kind of like a, a nuclear uh, Chernobyl kind of concept. So, we're, we're going to talk about that in, in a place where we have a, a really unique uh, position to, to study and speak about invasive species. So, um, you know, I mentioned the dracinid mussels, and it was just remarkable. Uh, you know, when we look at uh, their native range over here in the Ponto Caspian, eastern 
uh, Caspian Sea and, and, uh, and uh, non-native rays spreading northward into Europe, into the Baltic, and then you know catching a, a ship and, and ending up in the Laurentian Gray Lakes of North America. And you know what's really interesting in the place we work, we uh, have the dubious honor of probably having the largest brown gobies perhaps globally from the research that, that we've seen. So I'll make that statement that the Upper St. Lawrence River may have the largest brown gobies globally, and I, I think that um, is a testament to their success in our ecosystem, right? So they, they wouldn't be wimpy and small if, if they weren't doing well there. So we, we've been doing a lot of research on this because we have this, this dubious honor. So, you know, the goby story is one of trade-offs. So, and we've seen this before in fisheries. So it, now the goby is our forage base. We've got like world-class smallmouth bass fisheries. Uh, St. Lawrence was ranked number one in North America last year. They're number two this year, even though they just broke the all-time record for smallmouth in the most recent tournament. And you know, so it's kind of like everybody remembers this cartoon, Far Side. I'm a huge Far Side fan. Here's you know, here's the deer with the other deer talking to him, and he's got a bullseye on his chest. So I, I kind of feel like this this wildlife cartoon is kind of analogous to the St. Lawrence River. I don't know if Janet Lantry's here. She would probably, she's the uh, fish manager for the region. So there's there's a lot of issues in the river, a lot of popularity, and, and it's kind of like having a bullseye on your chest. So, you know, uh, we've, we've worked uh, with our students looking at the impacts on, on predators like smallmouth bass, and, and they're, they're, they're reaching these incredible proportions. Like this fish that was the state record, uh, tied for the state record, was only like 21 inches long. <laughs> so it's basically like a, a football here. And, and it makes you wonder, do gobies have anything to do with this? So, you know, and then, you know, another part of the trade-off is what's happened to our native benthic fishes. So this is data here from our, our we do an annual saning index. Uh, this is our darter catch uh, over time through and multiple surveys. So we have a couple sanding surveys, and then we have a, a trap netting survey we do every year. And, and we've seen like a complete loss of tessellated darter in the system. They kind of sputtered along until we saw our last one. You can see there's two individuals in the last couple years. Um, this used to represent, these, these darters used to represent 14% of the young of the year musky diet. So this, this was an important species. It's not, uh, it, it's, it's a native fish, it's a tessellated darter. Um, and uh, we also had uh, other abundant species um, like the slimy scalp in here. And, and our native, uh, uh, in this log perch, our native uh, benthic fishes, you know, have, have really disappeared and, and have been taken over by, by this round goby. And uh, what's interesting is is this tube-nosed goby is a recent invader, came in in 2011, and has actually proliferated on top of round goby. So they, they're they sympatric and they overlap spatially. So it's kind of interesting that you have one tiny, like two inch benthic fish that's able to proliferate on top of round goby, and then all our native benthic fishes just disappear and run for the for the doors. So that that's kind of an interesting, uh, question that, that, that we've been looking at. Um, here's our our giant goby that we affectionately call the goby scalonge uh, because it's it's reaching these incredible uh, sizes and dimensions. And we're we're looking. We've been doing some work. This is with my former student uh, Andrew Miano, um, and we there's a lot more to the story. But we studied and compared diets uh, in coastal abatements of both small and large. Uh, round goby, uh, these large ones. And what we find is something that's really kind of unique. If we were looking at trophic position, these larger gobies actually occupy a lower trophic niche than their smaller counterparts. So th that's kind of unique. Uh, there are some fishes that do that, that are reduced in trophic position as they reach adulthood. Most fish uh, increase in trophic position. But we think it's because they, they specialize to a greater degree on, on large dry synods. Okay, so if you look at the carbon sourcing here and this isotope analysis, you know, we have a more diverse diet, a uh, little more invertebrates. So we also find that these smaller gobies are the primary egg predators, and then the large gobies are shifting away from that a bit. You know, there's overlap here, and, and we see a, 
uh, 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 concentration uh, to a greater degree on, on uh, dracinid muscles and, and a, a change in that carbon sourcing. So, you know, it's interesting to think about the tube nose goby. You can see these little tubes. These things are spreading downriver. Uh, I work closely with Jessica Goretzky and others on this project. And uh, Jessica's now at Cape Vincent with DEC. And when we look at their diets, and this is also a project uh, that we're working on with Roxanne Rizavi uh, with a new student, and this is Amon Poxad's data. She just uh, finished her master's, and we looked at diets and mercury uptake of both large and small goby again, and then tube nose. And, and what you see is like this dracinid block, again, being larger for the large round goby, so it's consistent, smaller round goby, smaller dracinid block, and then tube nose, these things are tiny, they're really not eating dracinids at all, so we, so we think that there, there could be the possibility of a, like a functional facilitation of tube nose goby in this round goby habitat. They tend to be a little bit shallower, accessing more like wetland, type habitats uh, and then, then we see in the, the round goby um, and, and they're, so they found uh, a niche so in this niche separation. So they seem to be uh, being favored uh, by these dynamics that are going on in the system, whereas native fish are leaving. So very interesting. So moving on uh, about this, this concept of meltdown. So we're going to switch to predators here. So you know we've been studying muskies. This is uh, our book in muskie management um, that was published through AFS uh, at a symposium that was now seven years ago. Hard to believe, but we, we had a, a massive die-off of, of uh, muskies. So it's, it's making a long story short, uh, muskie populations had declined due to over-exploitation and working with DEC and other partners, um, size limit increases happened and then uh, uh, voluntary catch and release uh, came into play and musky populations rebounded dramatically in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And we were feeling like rock stars in the community. People would pat you on the back, maybe try to buy you a drink or something, which I tried to avoid. But what, what happened was, is all of a sudden I started getting calls and carcasses of large adult muskellunge uh, from 2005 to 2008, which were floating up to the surface I dove to find them on the bottom as well. Uh, we worked with uh, Rod Getchell and Paul Bowser at the Cornell Vet College to figure out what was going on here. And it, it turns out that there was a, a novel uh, virus that came into the ecosystem that muskie were really sensitive to, viral hemor hemorrhage and septicemia, uh, that was determined to be killing off uh, large numbers of muskie. So usually you see that in the media. I mean, there's a lot of DEC folks here. They all get calls from the media. Oh, there's been a fish kill. Oh, there's been a fish kill. Fish kills happen all the time for, for a variety of reasons. Usually they don't impact population processes to where you're like, what the heck's going on? This has been a different situation. So, you know, we had round, and we can't, the other thing is we can't really separate round goby introduction from VHSV. They didn't come together, but you're, you're gonna learn more about that in a second. So, so those introductions happen here. This is our trap netting survey for spawning adult muscalunge that we've done in a standardized set of sites uh, th throughout the St. Lawrence River. And, and these are our catch rates. And you know, before, uh, you can see these gaps in here, there was a management decision because this work is so intense that we reduced uh, the effort to doing it every third year. So our last survey was in 2003, this virus hit. We're like, we need data. So we started uh, annual sampling and even increased our effort. Um, and, and we just saw that some of these sites fell into what you might be worried about extirpation. So we've got Blind Bay um, and all these sites just kind of sputtering along with much lower catch rates. And then, you know, there's a lot more data to this, but I just wanted to, the eDNA is a new tool that we've applied. I've been working with uh, Hyatt Green and our ESF uh, microbiology and uh, molecular ecology uh, group, and Max Wilder is a PhD student, and we developed an assay to, to complement our field sampling, so we included a spotlight survey, these are all our index bays that we trap net. I don't have our seining data here, but what, what I want you to note is that there's a lot of gaps in here. And we developed this eDNA assay to, to take water, we took water samples in these sites, and um, we were able to detect uh, musky DNA in sites where 
traditional sampling weren't we weren't finding fish consistently so it was kind of optimistic to know that they were uh, fish still there um, but we we also note that there was a site here where no traditional sample can find a muskie and then we get an eDNA positive here so that's that's kind of interesting they're really at that low level or maybe it's within you know sample variability and then this Peos Bay near Cape Vincent no no detections for anything so possibly the population is ex extirpated there and it used to be a massively important uh, nursery site spotting nursery site so eDNA was a very valuable tool in looking at this um, I've got one more molecular story and looking at the virus itself so this is kind of molecular viral evolution um, so we're looking at the development of new isolates so the whole VHSB virus was a cold water virus that came from Europe and it was and then it became a salt water virus and then it mutated into this type 4b that allowed it to come into fresh water and into the Great Lakes and cause all this disruption um, and and oh and that thing is like forming prunes this 4b has prunes as it evolves in the ecosystem and it's kind of like a co-evolutionary arms race between its host who's developing immunity and the changes in the virus so we, we looked at this is work by my phd student anna haas um, she's graduating soon this is an elect, uh, uh, sem electron micrograph of the virus itself and and what we're seeing is that over time the virus is still in the ecosystem after all these years. So here's uh, five years of data. And we're also seeing an increase in the numbers of different types of isolates. So Rod Getchell has played a big role in this work as well. Um, so we were looking at this temporal change uh, in the VHSV virus, but we're also looking at who is the most competent host. So we've been looking at muscalunge and, and other species in the near shore aquatic ecosystem and the smoking gun comes out that it's round goby. So round goby is uh, providing this, this competency and serving as the, the primary reservoir for VHSV. And further than that, we know round goby are cereal, cereal spawners. Uh, they're highly abundant, and, and the food web is kind of organized around them. So a lot of fish species are getting exposed to virus through, through predation on round, uh, round goby, perhaps through their gillamele. And, and we see that the number of isolates has just increased. So Anna did this amazing work that's adding uh, nine new known isolates of VHSV that she's described in the ecosystem and also made a linkage uh, to this principal host. Um, so very, very exciting work. So, you know, another part of the talk is what are we gonna do about it? <laughs> so we, we have a partnership with US Fish and Wildlife Service and, and DEC um, and others to, to actually do an experimental program. So we're releasing fry and fingerling muscalunge. We, we can work, we work with Scott Schluter and Justin Egret. Uh, they're doing netting in the Lake St. Lawrence region and, and the population seems to be in better shape down there. Um, so we're, we're taking broodstock from the TI region but also down river and, and getting um, fry and fingerlings that we raise in our system we're now developing a, a relationship uh, and we've developed a relationship with DEC and their hatchery system that have been assisting with this a great deal and we're trying to restore lost and known spawning and nursery sites and then monitor the population response so we have release of uh, fry that are OTC marked and then fingerlings are given a uh, chip so they got a pit tag for those of you that were in the pit tag symposium you can't enter this kind of restorative quote unquote stocking program without understanding genetics. So we, we've done a lot of work um, looking at the muskie genome. This, we got the cover of Evolutionary Applications in 2019. Uh, my, my student Kevin Kapusinski studied uh, uh, population structuring throughout the Great Lakes. And then I recently worked with Louis Bernacci um, and his lab um, out at Laval. And we actually um, looked at uh, integration of uh, musky genes in the in the St. Lawrence throughout the St. Lawrence River, which has received about 40 years of stocking, and it, it's quite striking. I'm just going to give a in, in about 40 years of stocking in, in the in the lower St. Lawrence, you would think that the populations that have developed around Montreal and the sewage plume would be from this stocking source, which is primarily from Kawartha Lakes, also uh, Ohio strain like Chautauqua fish, 
that, that go all the way up there. And what was found is that none of the fish in the main stem really have a high level of integration of those genes. They were pure St. Lawrence fish. And there were populations that were adjacent in lakes that had the, the marking and the population structure of the stock fish. So interestingly, you know, the, the environment is what's structuring and selecting for those genetic uh, strains. So we're trying to use those in our restoration to maintain this, uh, in, you know, remarkable St. Lawrence River fish that produces world-class uh, musky fishing and serves as an apex predator. So, you know, we have a long-term sailing, sailing database. We look at habitat, um, and we've, we've caught, um, and it targets these young muscalonge on the nursery grounds. Uh, so we really focus on small fish and recruitment. Each one of these points, I don't have like the, the variation and all that in here just to simplify it, but each one of these points is 90 Sainals. Okay, so you think about the crews covering the entire St. Lawrence River, pulling these nets, looking at the, the vegetation. This, this proves that I actually was out there. That's me right there. And uh, so anyhow, you know, we, we, each one of these is a, a, a true estimate of CUE, which is the catch, um, and we do it in a standardized fashion, and we've done that um, since 1990. This data is from 1996, and you can see this crash um, after VHSB hit and, and the number of young that we're seeing on the nursery ground. And then you see this, these increases, and these correspond to a pilot study we did on the advanced fry stocking. One inch fish were released at 750 per hectare in these nursery habitats, and it really elevated the young, um, which kind of told us that we might have a recruitment bottleneck. And you can see this, in, this sequential decline in 2012, the increase, then we stopped stocking, it jumped, it went right back down. So there's an international muskie working group uh, and working with uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in DC, uh, it was decided to, to, to try to restore these sites. So we began uh, fry stocking in earnest. The fingerling stocking happens after these surveys, which is really nice because I can separate uh, analysis of those two sets of data. But the fry stocking shows that the habitat is still functioning. Um, I just want to follow up with a little bit on musky behavior. So Steve LePan, a lot of people probably know him here. Um, he just recently retired, but when he was a graduate student at, at ESF, and then an employee, we started a big uh, musky behavioral telemetry study as part of the management. Nobody knew where these fish went. And uh, we did rate, uh, 47 tags were put on, on muskies, and he tracked them with an airplane. Um, I think he uh, went out with Neil Ringler. I, I used to as well, who's a retired professor at ESF. We followed these fish, both with boats and, and tracking. And, and they, they told us, the, the study told us a couple things. The fish were highly migratory, and there were some that were residents, and they also had fidelity. So um, I, I just got my five minute. Uh, sign here, but you know we're work now we're working with the GLaDOS system, so we're kind of repeating these studies to see if that massive mortality may have affected um, the the uh, musky behavior. So GLaDOS is a, a suite of uh, receivers. We surgically implant um, these these tags, these acoustic tags that give out a ping. This is John Paul LeBlanc, uh, one of our scientists, putting in the receivers, and we we actually recaptured one, and you can see the heel scar. Here. So we're, we're, we're working with U.S. Fish and 